a virtual Hanseatic League. I will once again put on my futurologist hat in this video and talk about some of the predictions uh, my good friend David Lesperance and I considered while writing our book Flight of the Golden Geese. Now, Golden Geese are high net worth individuals who are fleeing from high taxation. But that was over a decade ago. What has happened since has only served to convince us that as Baudrillard commented, history is in reverse. For example, the rise of the city-state is back on the agenda. The totalitarian behaviour of democratic governments during the Covid pandemic has given them the taste for total control over their populations and points towards some Western countries degenerating from being policed states into police states. They're moving along what von Hayek termed the road, road to serfdom, that is from democracy to tyranny. A massive increase in tax on the rich is on the cards, as governments look to recoup the deficit from two years of lockdown. The, the Western lifestyle of the past half century, of excesses for many citizens, the envy of the rest of the world, is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. For thus began the fierce endeavour of the state to squeeze the population to the last drop. Since economic resources fell short of what was needed, the full rigour of the law was let loose on the population. Soldiers acted as bailiffs and wandered as secret police through the land. Those who suffered most were, of course, the property classes. It was relatively easy to lay hands on their property. <laughs> Does this sound familiar? No, this isn't today's Britain with its middle classes ravaged by stealth taxes, speed cameras, national insurance, income tax, death duties, VAT, petrol, alcohol, tobacco duty, congestion and other community charges, etc, etc. It isn't today's USA with federal government clawing back money from taxpayers to cover what it squandered on various ill-advised misadventures, including its Covid response, the military escapades and the support of crumbling banks and other failing financial institutions. No, this is a quotation from the Cambridge Ancient History, describing the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Once again the state is the predator. If the propertied class buried their money or sacrificed up to two-thirds of their estates to escape, or went so far as to give up their whole property in order to get free of the domain's rent, and while the non-propertied class just ran away, the state replied, by increasing the pressure. This is why large hordes of Roman gold and silver are still being unearthed across Europe. The owners were burying and hiding their wealth not from barbarians but from the swarms of state registered looters. Don't think that this couldn't happen in today in a democracy. Because a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until a majority of voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. That is, out of the taxation of others. And then what? According to Plato's Republic, democracy always mutates into tyranny. And that mutation is already underway. However, Paul Romer has identified a solution to this problem in his analysis of the economies of developing countries. He warned that the rules of the past, for example, endemic corruption, 
which advantages certain politically strong groups in society need to be changed to suit the newly emerging socio-economic conditions. However, many countries find changes impossible because the politically powerful in the country refuse to give up their subsidised advantages. Hence, society loses out on new innovations, failing to take advantage of the natural talent in its midst, and it slowly yet inexorably slides into decline. Roma's big question also needs to be answered by developed nations, for they too faced entrenched vested interests blocking change. Trades unions, for example, an anachronism from the industrial age, or, or minimum wage regulations. How do both developed and developing nations instigate the requisite change at the beginning of this 21st century? How can nations overcome the inertial forces that preserve the moribund rules and structures that only reinforce a decaying status quo? If they fail in this, they will find that outsiders, without these shackles, will leapfrog into an economic bleed. Roma says that the real challenge then is to try and figure out how we can change rules. Are there some rules we can develop for changing rules? His answer for developing countries with stultifying rules that cannot be changed is to give more choices to people. Charter cities, new places with new rules that people can opt into. These are special zones built on uninhabited land in conjunction with capital investment from other richer states. A charter, a form of Bill of Rights, will specify the rules under which the city operates, free of the demands of the host country. These rules are guaranteed by that country and, more importantly, by the other investing states and protect the region from the insidious practices endemic in the rest of the host country. Now, Roma rejects all accusations, accusations of a new imperialism in his model. He says that this is partnership. There's no coercion no condescension. As an example, he recommended that Cuba sets up a charter city, a new Hong Kong, in Guantanamo Bay with Canada and possibly Brazil and Spain as partners. He also believes that this model is the way forward for Africa. The charter enables countries to throw off past economic mince management and corrupt practices and make credible promises for viable long-term investment opportunities in these chartered zones. Good rules in the charter city will attract in employers and with it comes choices for the general population. Just as importantly, it gives choices to the leaders who elsewhere in the country are finding it politically impossible to force through the necessary changes for economic growth. Because no one is forced to live in these cities, but as they attract investment, workers will choose to migrate there, looking for employment, thereby undermining the stranglehold the old ways have over the rest of the region. Roma's model is an idealised version of the way Deng Xiaoping forced through China's economic miracle against enormous opposition. Deng used the exemplar of Hong Kong to build special economic zones with foreign investment facilitated by cheap money and financial expertise in Hong Kong and other tax havens his wonderful aphorisms, to get rich is glorious, and, and some areas must get rich before others, trumpet the pragmatic wisdom 
of one of the greatest leaders of the 21st century and a prophet for the 21st. How ironic that the future of capitalism was born in a so-called communist state. Although it shouldn't be that surprising since the necessary social innovations were never going to be found in the smug orthodoxy of degenerating Western democratic states unless they too allow the creation of zones that are free from the so-called old Spanish practices. It's now time to ask what will happen should the trickle of the escaping golden geese of our book hemorrhage the wealth of Western nations. Naturally, those countries losing the most won't just stand idly by. They will strike back. Uh, with their wealth under increasing attack, the, the Golden Greece will have to organize and defend themselves. Now, all long-standing personal animosities among the wealthy must be forgotten in the face of a powerful common enemy. We expect them to use Deng's great insight into forcing through change against apparently insurmountable odds. Now, these golden geese will form collectives, independent of any particular nation state, possibly as a physical charter city state, but more likely as virtual sovereignties. Such sovereignties take their inspiration from William Rees Mogg's idea of the sovereign individual. However, rather than operating as individuals, the Golden Geese will flock together to form a new Hanseatic League, possibly geographically located a la Roma, or possibly, and preferably, off-planet as virtual sovereignties. Initially, the mega-rich entrepreneurs, the merchants, the high-net-worth individuals, the golden geese, will group together to compose their own charters with which to approach amenable, smart regions as nominal jurisdictions with a view of constructing physical or virtual charter cities, autonomous bases from which to run their commercial operations. As traders and guardians of the host virtual or physical city-state, they will use the charter as a mutual formal agreement from which to build what is to them an ideal form of governance. They will be citizens solely of that and possibly other charter cities and that citizenship will be recognised increasingly around the world. They will give up previously held citizenships, and with that, they also give up any tax liability. These super-rich will own properties all over the globe and will move between them, ensuring they don't fall foul of any local tax regulations. The Charter City will be run on mutual self-interest, on the principle that the Golden Geese either hang together or they hang separately. They will be loosely organised like the original Hansa, which operated trading posts, they called them contours, across Europe. A charter city is merely a modern form of contour. The London contour, subsequently known as the Steel Yard, was founded around the beginning of the 14th century, roughly where Cannon Street Station stands today. It was typical in that it was separate. It was a separate walled community, enclosing warehouses that fronted onto the river, the River Thames, with its own weighing house, offices, counting houses, church, and residential homes. The Hansa negotiated mutually advantageous trade agreements with countries across Europe. For example, in 1157, King Henry II freed merchants from Cologne of all London tolls and they were allowed to trade across Europe. The Hansa ran their own legal system and created a form of political autonomy supported, defended by various mutual aid agreements. 
the Le League even declared war on Denmark between 1361 and 1370, against the Dutch between 1438 and 1441, which they lost, and Amsterdam traders benefited, and against England between 1470 and 1472. The Hansa gained some major advantages from the 1474 Treaty of Utrecht. In a similar way, the new Hanseatic League will be autonomous. It runs its own courts as specified in the Charter, offer its own passports and travel documents, but most importantly, issue its own commercial currencies, some based on a basket of other currencies, raw materials and commodities, others as private cyber currencies. The League would be composed of more than one virtual Hansa, which has the added advantage of choice and competition among the golden geese, adding vigour and efficiency to the development of the new Hansas. So what do the super wealthy want expect? Effective travel documents, high levels of security, pleasant surroundings, the rule of law and the freedom of movement to do business globally. The virtual Hanseatic League will supply all these cheaper, faster and without the gross inefficiencies of the present nation state. The state was devised for the superfluous ones and the league will be designed for the super rich. There is the question of some countries refusing to accept a Hansa passport. However, the sheer financial muscle of the League will soon overcome that problem. The economic logic of Las Vegas will prevail. Hotels bend over backwards to welcome high rollers, with free accommodation, restaurants and other luxuries, even sending private jets to pick them up. Similarly, countries will be more than happy to extend golden visas and rights to stay to the high-end tourist temporary residence. Uh, countries already spend millions of dollars on advertising, just trying to attract them. Should any country play hardball, then league members would informally boycott it only absolutely necessary business trips being considered. Just like real retail stores have no choice other than to, than to accept credit cards or they will lose custom to those businesses that do accept them, countries have no alternative. The high rollers are visiting for business and pleasure both of which create jobs for those who are the only ones that actually pay income taxes. Of course, everyone will pay taxes on consumption, the rich included. Each Hansa will screen applicants for membership and rigorous background checks undertaken by the likes of Kroll at the expense of the aspiring golden geese themselves, uh, these will ensure they welcome only the extremely wealthy with no criminal or terrorist links. The, the Hansa will expect very high standards of probity and will turn away questionable individuals. The group is, is, is self-policing. Members are jealous of their good reputations and will instantly remove any Hansa citizenship from troublemakers. Its travel documents offer what national documents do not, guarantees on the behaviour of its members and insurance. The cost of any damage caused by foreign nationals travelling on normal passports has to be reclaimed through the courts with no guarantee of recovery. On the other hand, the travel documents of a particular Hansa are a bond that underwrites remuneration of all proved damage and loss on the rare occasions when there is a problem. 
Membership of Ahansa is by invitation only, and it comes with responsibility. Anyone who falls out of favour because of a falling credit rating or misbehaviour that offends and disadvantages the League will have membership cancelled immediately. Uh, the League will employ itinerant judges that travel the world meeting out instant justice on all Hansa miscreants. Any Hansa whose members persistently disadvantage the League will also be banished. In return, the League will expect their travel documents to be treated as diplomatic passports. Automatic visa waivers and specialised entry with super-fast track immigration is demanded. Detailed information on members will be sent to the host country well in advance of any visit, with everything down to the smallest detail already arranged. Now, passports are the original means whereby a state identified anonymous visitors that arrive en masse before the age of computers. The super rich are far from being anonymous. They are known in advance, their details and itinerary already forwarded, all arrangements made. So why bother with a passport? The Golden Geese expect arrangements to be seamless, including a bundle of services relating to health, entertainment, diplomatic issues and finance. Now, modern travel is a great inconvenience for ordinary travel, but for the Hansa, uh, these golden geese, from the moment they walk off the plane to be met by their favourite local drivers, there is no check-in at the hotel. They walk to their room where their anti-allergic pillow, bathing suit, favourite champagne and chocolates will already be there awaiting them. And when they leave, they just leave. Everything is done for these wealth operators, these wealth generators. They, their universally recognised virtual identity is their black card. In this way, the golden geese are no longer reliant on any nation state. They simply buy the best wherever it is in the world. Nation states have already lost their exclusive monopoly on medical services, uh, only the poor in society will be dependent on the state for health care. And with escalating costs, services increasingly become rationed and second rate, driving even more and more people into the private sector. State education, particularly higher education, has become far too expensive for the nation state. It's an anachronism again. The coming decades will see the rise of super universities delivering uh, universal distance e-learning. The lecture material itself will be totally free. Payment is made only for extra tuition, entrance to examinations and any subsequent certification. Now, only the children of the wealthy will actually be taught on a campus with one-to-one -one in person access to the academic staff. As for the rest, they will have to make do with social network study groups and clubs, with, with all meetings arranged via social media. Then the security, the, the super rich already buy their own security. Private military companies like Control Risks and security companies like Kroll train their clients in anti-kidnap techniques and supply bodyguards and incident management teams to deal with kidnapping, extortion and natural disasters. When Hurricane Ivan hit the Cayman Islands in 2004, one of David Lesperance's clients quickly arranged with control risks to get her out, not bothering with uh, political niceties as other countries are obliged to do, 
a team simply landed, secured the, the perimeter of a home so there was no looting, sorted out water purification, food and electricity, and just to be good citizens while awaiting extradition, they helped with the local relief effort. The lady, together with a number of her stranded friends, were quickly whisked off to safety in Canada. However, in the chaos, some of them had lost all their possessions, including their passports. They needn't have worried, for by the time they landed in Canada, everything had been arranged with the relevant embassies uh, issuing emergency passports. This is the model for the future. This is the model for virtual answers. Now, on the rare occasions they would need an armed response, they have the financial muscle to hire a mercenary foreign, re region, foreign legion, very much in the way that medieval kings would do it. Uh, like I said, history really is in reverse. Thank you very much.